I'm Steve Young, and I'd like to tell you about a real hero of mine named Tyler Wilkinson. Tyler Wilkinson is one of the most talented high school athletes to ever come out of the state of Utah. On the football field, he electrified fans who came in droves to watch him make runs like this. With the score tied, Spanish Fork will try to kick this ball away from him. He's been virtually unstoppable. He takes the ball on the 14-yard line. Tyler Wilkinson back to the 20, the 25, the 30. Breaks a tackle at the 30. He's into the open for a moment. They've got him trapped on the sideline. He runs over one man. Trapped again on the sideline. Breaks another tackle. He's heading for the end zone. He could go all the way. He's at the 20, the 15, the 10. Tyler Wilkinson scores again. With bulldog determination and cat-like quickness, Tyler fought his way to become only the second wrestler in his school's history to win a coveted state championship. As a baseball player, Tyler was a pro prospect hitting an amazing 450 as a center fielder and garnering first-team All-State honors. Tyler's brother Troy is the oldest of the Wilkinson boys. He is a former Mr. Utah and national place finisher in the Mr. America contest. Ever since Tyler was born, he dreamed about being a great football player, dancing down the sidelines. Uh, he was a gifted athlete that worked harder than anyone I'd ever seen. While other kids were riding their bikes, riding their skateboards, Tyler was working out. We'd catch him doing 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, and uh, always flexing in the mirror, trying to improve his physique as much as he could and his strength because of his wanting to be a good athlete, a great athlete. The dreams, the work, the waiting finally paid off. Here's Brian Hickman, the quarterback, back to throw. Sprints out to the right side, throws long, deep. There's a crowd there. I don't believe it. Tyler Wilkinson caught the ball. He took it away from everybody. Touchdown, Dixie. On Tyler's final game of the season, an opposing lineman grabbed him by his jersey and tore it off his back. It didn't stop Tyler. He ran into the end zone for the touchdown, wearing only shoulder pads. The very first time Tyler touched the football his senior year, he raced 56 yards for a touchdown. It seemed that every time the shifty quick back touched the ball, he was creating something exciting. He would go full speed this way and go full speed that way, just, just like that. It was incredible. He'd, he'd plant and boom, he's gone just like that. And then back again. I mean, and so you're like, Ugh. You know, you see a lot of, you know, professional players and stuff that. You know, they're going full speed and they can turn and cut and cut back on full speed. Well, you know, you wouldn't think you could see that on a high school level. But, you know, after playing against him a few times, he comes down and he's coming full speed at you. And so you think you're going to have a pretty good collision. You're getting ready. And next thing you know, he's going the other direction and you can't cut with him. And so you end up with a face full of grass. You can move from one side to the other at full speed, laterally at full speed, and then head up field. I mean, I don't know if you ever tried that, but it's awful difficult. And he had such a, a vision of the field. He could see everybody and everything that was happening at the same time. You hear the term faked right out of your shirt. He literally did that. And he asked me, what do we do to stop Dixie? And I said, you stop Wilkinson. He said, you stop Wilkinson, you stop Dixie. One particular play in that game will never be forgotten. Ryan Hickman sets his team in the I formation, sends his flanker back in motion to the near side. Here's the handoff to Tyler Wilkins, and he starts inside, veers to the outside, breaks a tackle. Now he's hemmed in on the sideline. One, two, three, four men have got him. He breaks away. He's going to go all the way. Touchdown, Tyler Wilkinson. In his three years at Dixie High School, Tyler had shredded enemy defenses for 3,400 yards. Every university and college in the state, as well as Stanford and Arizona State, were interested in Tyler as student-athlete. But Tyler opted to remain at home in St. George and play baseball and football for nationally ranked Dixie Community College for one very special reason. His girlfriend, the lovely Jennifer Orton, who would also be enrolling at Dixie College in the fall. Tyler had his life all planned out. He would play one year at Dixie College, then serve a two-year mission for the LDS Church. On his return, he and Jennifer would be married in the St. George LDS Temple for time and all eternity. Tyler had it all, a family that loved him, the cutest girl in St. George by his side, all stayed in three different sports and voted the outstanding athlete in his school. Life couldn't be better. His success in athletics had made him a hero. Tyler was on top of his world. 
On a brisk February day, Tyler left his home in St. George to travel to Springville, Utah, a four-hour drive north of St. George. Jennifer was performing as a member of Dixie High's drill team in state competition. Tyler was anxious to see her perform. As he drove, he played his favorite music and thought about Jennifer. Even though Tyler and Jennifer talked freely about getting married after Tyler's mission, Tyler never told her that he loved her. He knew this would be the special weekend. The hum and drone of the tires on the highway played an eerie lullaby. Tyler's eyes grew heavy. He struggled to keep awake. Sleep finally overtook him. When Tyler overcorrected, the truck rolled, slamming hard on its side into the pavement. It then leaped high into the air, landing with devastating force on its roof. In the cab, Tyler could hear the terrifying sounds of glass breaking and metal bending and folding. And suddenly the roof of the cab caved in and collapsed on Tyler's head, driving his chin deep into his chest. Tyler was helpless, unable to move. Arrangements were made to life flight him to Salt Lake City. We were, uh, we were sitting in the in the auditorium watching the gals dance and giving support to the jetettes. And uh, they called me out and asked me to go out and uh, visit with them. And they told me that it had happened. And it was very hard to believe. But the thought came to me that if anybody could pull through it, that it would be Tyler. Late Sunday night, while Tyler lay in critical condition, his bishop, Larry Gardner, penned a letter to Tyler expressing his deep love and support. I know that some are blaming God for what has happened. I know, Tyler, you're not. I explained to them that in the pre-existence we fought for our free agency, which is one of the greatest gifts that our Heavenly Father has given us. It gives us the freedom to act. The flip side of that gift is that it also gives us the freedom to be acted upon. We not only get to enjoy the blessings of a world governed by natural laws, but we also get the privilege of being subject to them. If God were to remove those laws and their governing influence over us, the whole plan of salvation would be disrupted. Tyler, you have been a high school hero in the way you have dealt with the opposition on the field. But now you have a chance to be a real hero. Everyone has to deal with some trial by fire. And since yours is presently one of intense heat, all eyes are upon you to see if your same spirit will prevail. Your example of faith, hope, courage, and determination will have a tremendous impact on others. Tyler awoke at 1 a.m. Sunday morning. The muscles that helped him breathe were no longer functioning. The monitor that registered the amount of oxygen in Tyler's blood indicated that he was not in danger. But Tyler didn't care what the machine said. He knew he was in trouble. I could hardly breathe, he would later say. It was like trying to breathe through a straw filled with liquid. If he didn't get help, he was certain he was going to die. He could hear the nurses in the hall. Unable to move his arms to reach the nurse's button, he did the only thing he could to try and get someone's attention. With great effort, he began clicking his tongue. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, a nurse entered the room. Tyler was thrilled. It seemed like relief had finally arrived. Tyler mouthed to the nurse that he couldn't breathe and that he was afraid he was going to die. The nurse was in a hurry. She glanced at the machine and told Tyler that he was fine. Then she turned and left the room. Tyler couldn't believe it. He panicked. You know, before I was ever injured, I saw people, you know, in wheelchairs, and I loved athletics more than anything at the time, it seemed. And I thought, you know, this is dead serious. When I, I would think, if that ever happened, you know, if, if I was ever put in a wheelchair, I, w I would rather die. You know, I'd rather die in the accident than be in a wheelchair because I couldn't play football, you know, I couldn't play baseball. And, and that's how you think, I guess, maybe when you're 
when you're 18 years old or, or maybe when you're 30 years old. Just, I, I don't know. Tyler was now faced with that decision. He looked deep within himself. Was his life based on football or baseball? No. I prayed more that night than I ever prayed. And a lot of times, a lot of times when I prayed that night, I thought, you know, saying, Heavenly Father, why don't you come and take me, you know, to the other side? Why don't you just come take me right now? Because that's how I felt. It was just one of those miserable kind of feelings. And as I thought about it, though, you know, I said, God, if I actually, I never really asked him. I thought about asking him because I thought, if I really ask him, he might answer my prayer, and I don't want to die, you know? Because I was thinking about Jan, and I was thinking about, I was thinking about my friends, I was thinking about my family, and I was thinking, yeah, I think there's some stuff to live for. I, I don't want to really die, even though I didn't like that time. But I was, I was glad when the morning came. I was really glad. He pleaded with his Heavenly Father to let him live. If his prayer was answered, he promised he would go on just as before with the same zest and passion for life he had always had. There would be no room, he promised, for self-pity, bad attitudes, or regrets. There would be no looking back. He had been dealt a harsh hand, but he would play it well. He would live life to the fullest. He would never play the game of football again, but he could play the game of life and be a winner. He told me that he loved me for the first time, and of course I felt kind of shocked because that wasn't something that we talked about openly or we ever said to each other even though we've been going out for so long. And then, then he said that he didn't want me to feel obligated. No matter what happened, he didn't want me to feel obligated. And I told him that it wasn't obligation that I felt, that it was love and I loved him. And, and it wasn't obligation I felt ever. And that's something that he was nervous about for a long time after. But now he knows that it's not obligation. So. Letters, telegrams, cards poured in. Flowers and balloons filled Tyler's room. Heisman winner Ty Detmer stopped by the hospital to visit Tyler. Super Bowl champion Jim McMahon phoned to wish him well. A football signed by the entire Miami Dolphin football team was delivered to Tyler's room. The governor of the state paid Tyler a visit along with college and university coaches. Why did so many people care? You reap the harvest from the seeds that you plant. And Tyler had planted many seeds along the way. In just a matter of weeks, he imagined himself lifting weights and building up his upper body. But these dreams were replaced by the simplest of goals, things he had taken for granted in the past, like learning to sit up by himself, pushing himself in a wheelchair, touching his face, and putting on his own shirt. He was helpless and progress was slow. He threw himself into vigorous rehabilitative activity. When I walked into the room to meet him for the first time, I will never forget the feeling in the room um, that there was this, this kid that had had all these things happen to him, yet he was sitting there smiling, like, I'm ready to go on. I know this is bad has happened to me, what can you do for me? And I'm still gonna be the best and I'm gonna tackle this problem. I was always one that would say, um, I have to set my goals high. And if you tell me that I'm not gonna walk, I just, I just can't believe that. I've gotta set that goal high and keep striving for it. That's what keeps me going. And in rehabilitation, I spent three and a half weeks in intensive care. Then I spent you know, then I spent about five months down in a rehabilitation center where I was going to learn how to do virtually everything again. And, you know, you can understand it was a frustrating and kind of a deal. It was really d discouraging a lot of times. But the thing that put an edge on the discouragement was looking forward to Jennifer, you know, coming up every weekend. Every weekend without, with only one exception, when she went on family vacation, she came up every single weekend, whether it was for one day, you know, she would just come, just, if she had to fly, she would fly up and fly back. My parents have made the situation I'm in so much nicer, so much better. He refused to take an electric wheelchair. He said, I'm gonna push this chair and I'm gonna find out if I can get it 
fast enough and well enough so I can go back to college in a manual wheelchair. It'll be better for me. And he said, don't worry, if I can't handle that manual wheelchair, I'll admit it that I was wrong and I'll come back to you and I'll say, you were right, give me a power wheelchair. But I knew just looking at him, he'd never do that. <laughs> he would never admit that defeat. He would, if it, he would push that chair through snow before he'd come back to me and say, you were right, I need a power wheelchair. Because I would have said he does. Just when it seemed Tyler was on schedule to make the trip to St. George for his high school graduation, adversity showed itself again. On March 10th, Tyler's lungs collapsed. In severe pain, he was rushed back to the hospital where he underwent a bronchiostomy. After three days in the hospital, he returned to rehabilitation and did everything he could to get ready for graduation. When word got out that he was working to come home for graduation, he was invited to be one of the main speakers. Um, first, just right off the start, I want to tell everybody to be careful, you know, tonight. And so my little sister, she didn't want me to bring it up, but, uh, she just got her license. <laughs> and, uh, I used to think the, us Wilkinsons were pretty good drivers, but we're not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you had to forgive me for not uh, standing up during the procession, right? Because I would have, you know, but <laughs> that little thing is flying around. Huh? The arena fell silent as Tyler spoke of trials, obstacles, challenges, sorrows, broken dreams, and heartaches. He taught them how to handle adversity. You must play the hand you are dealt, he instructed. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, that was the message. Cherish life, he counseled. Be happy. It's up to each of us to take control of our own destiny. That I've helped Tyler so much, and I'm always there for him, and I do so much for him, and, and maybe they can't believe that that I've stuck with him and they think that's so awesome and everything, but what they don't understand is that it's a two-way street. It's not me doing everything for Tyler and me going up and seeing him every weekend at the rehab and me doing this and me doing that. It's not that. It's He does stuff for me too. He's as much of a strength for me, if not more, than I am for him. It was, it was midnight, it was late. I just uh, helped Tyler get into bed, <clears throat> sat down on the edge of his bed to visit with him and talk. And uh, we were having a good visit, and then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, uh, Tyler said, you know, Dad, for uh, 18 years, I was on top of the world. I mean, absolutely on top of the world. When you stop and think about that the Lord had blessed me with a great athletic ability, that I had a beautiful girlfriend with a wholesome relationship, that I had signed a letter of intent to play football under scholarship for Dixie College and to play baseball for them, and just getting ready to do my papers to send in for my mission and doing well in school. How could have I asked for more? I was literally on top of the world. And then all of a sudden, in a matter of 10 seconds, it all changed, absolutely changed. And when he said that, I have to indicate to you that up until now, I had always wondered, why have I never heard Tyler say, why did this happen to me? Why me? Because I'd never heard him say it, nor have I ever heard him say it yet. But when he said that, we were alone at night, nobody else around, he didn't have to impress anybody, and I thought to myself, here it comes. Finally, for the first time, I'm gonna hear him lament somewhat. And then the next thing he said was, and you know, Dad, for the last 18 months, I've been on top of another world I would have never known about. I can honestly say, I feel like I'm, I'm on top of a whole different world now, a whole nother world. And I'm excited. I, I really, I'm excited about what what the future holds. I mean, it's got, I've got so much to look forward to.